Hi, I'm Royce Rosewood. This is Science Fantasy Awesome. I play solo role-playing games here on the channel, and I've had a couple of different viewers ask if I could do a tutorial on how to use the Mythic Game Master Emulator 2nd Edition. I thought that sounded like a great idea. If you're not familiar with Mythic, what it is, it's a tool that allows you to play any tabletop role-playing game either by yourself or without a Game Master. It helps structure and guide a campaign from scene to scene, and it also generates surprises. Uh, before we get into this, uh, just so you know, this is not sponsored content. This is just me, a fan, trying to help other players. Uh, but if you'd like to support the channel, there is an affiliate link in the description. Any purchase that you make uh, helps support the channel. This is the hardback second edition. It looks uh, quite large and hefty, but do not be intimidated. The actual rules are quite simple. The reason that this book is so big is because it is full of play examples that are very detailed. It is full of variations for different ways to use the system. Um, so uh, do not be put off by the size of this tome. So what I'm going to be doing today is giving you a quick outline of the system and but I really recommend that you read this whole thing. It's got lots of great advice, um, not just for Mythic, but for solo play in general. So I'm going to take you through step by step how to get ready and play Mythic. So we're going to go through the five steps, which are preparation, uh, setting up the first scene, playing scenes and asking questions, uh, ending the scene and bookkeeping, and then testing the next scene. And in doing so, we'll touch on what I consider to be the five main pieces of the mythic machine. And that is the adventure lists, the fate chart, the chaos factor, random scenes, and the meaning tables. Uh, and we'll see how all of these pieces fit together to make the machine of mythic work. Caveat, this is all my interpretation of mythic. Uh, there may be other ways to look at it. and then. At a certain point, there's sort of an art and style to how you use it. So this is my opinions of how to use the system. If you want the best and most accurate information, read the book yourself. But I'm here to help guide and maybe give you a little bit of a head start. So uh, I'm going to assume that you already have a system picked out that you want to play. This could be Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, GURPS, Fate. I mean, there's millions of systems out there. So you've got one picked out and then go ahead and create a character or characters that you want to play for that system. And then go ahead and find or pick out any supplemental oracles that you might need. So what are these? These could be random tables. They could be decks of cards, story cubes, online generators, you know, illustrated cards, anything that you're going to need uh, that mythic doesn't cover. Now, if you don't have any, that's fine because Mythic has tools that could replace any of these things. But if you're anticipating a particular style of play, for example, if you're anticipating going into a dungeon, you'll probably need some sort of method to generate that dungeon. Uh, Mythic can do that for sure. But if you're looking for a specific kind of experience, you'll want a specific tool to generate that in more detail. You know, if you're anticipating meeting a lot of characters, you know, some sort of table that will help you generate specific characters that fit into your setting. You know, anything where you're like, mm, I really want to play this kind of a game, make sure you have a tool picked out uh, that will help you play that. It's just helpful to have them ready. So if you encounter that in play, you're not spending your time looking for some sort of tool, you can just dive right in. All right, so you've got your system, you've got your characters, you've got any supplemental materials that you're going to use. Now we need to prepare our adventure. So we're gonna to need to prepare our adventure lists, our chaos factor, and also decide how we're gonna record our game. First off, the adventure lists. There are two, there's the thread list and the character list. The printable version is on page 193 of the book. I recommend printing that out if you are going to play analog. The adventure lists are ways to keep track of things that you find important or interesting about your campaign. It's your way of telling Mythic, these are the things that I'm interested in. These are the kinds of things that I, the player, want to show up. While you don't have to put anything on these lists before you start play, I recommend it um, because it helps get the ball rolling. And also, if you have a random event show up early, you want something on these lists so that you can generate something. There's some advice about 
seeding the adventure lists in the book on page 63. So first up, the thread list. So a thread is a mission, a job, a quest that your character has taken on. That's kind of the most basic way to think about it. There are other things that you can put on the thread list, but for now, just think about it that way. So based on what you know about your character already, try to think of like two or three uh, quests or tasks or missions that they might be trying to accomplish. These should be things that you, the player, are interested in pursuing. Because it's your game. If you are not interested in seeing these threads through, you're not going to be motivated to play and you're not going to be interested to see how these things turn out. So pick things that get you really excited. Now this could be different for different players. You know, you might be really excited about slaying a dragon and another player might be interested about, you know, collecting five plants. If you're not sure about what to put here, you can use a helpful oracle to generate ideas. In Mythic, you could look at the action table or you could look at the character motivation table to help inspire some ideas. So that's the thread list. And then there's also the character list. Uh, characters are important NPCs, uh, non-player characters that you want to see and interact with at some point in the game. Allies, uh, family members, uh, these could be people in town, uh, they could be enemies, rivals, they could be entire factions. So based on what you know about your character and the setting, uh, try to come up with like two, three, four characters that you are interested in seeing come up in play. Uh, you know, you don't have to fully flesh them out right now. Uh, in one of my campaigns on the channel, I, you know, just put very general descriptions. I put things like family member and local contact. And then when that came up in play, then I used more oracles to generate more information about that character. So I didn't have to come up with everything right away. So again, if you don't have any ideas, you can use um, an oracle or a supplement to help you generate characters. In Mythic, you could look at the descriptor tables and then there's also character description tables. So you've set up your adventure lists and now you need some way to track the chaos factor. The chaos factor is a number that fluctuates between one and nine. Uh, it starts at five. I recommend just writing it on a piece of paper uh, and then crossing it out or erasing it as it goes up and down. The chaos factor represents the way a game master will kind of control the flow of action, you know, letting things, you know, speed up and get out of control and slowing things down at other times. And then speaking of paper, uh, you're going to want a way to record your game. So you could, you know, take notes after every scene, you know, in kind of a journal or just on paper. You could make audio notes, recording your voice. You could make videos like I do. That's how I record my campaigns for this channel. Whatever makes sense to you and whatever works for you and your brain and your play style. It's just a way to help you remember the things that have happened in case there's a long time in between sessions. Um, you know, and these things get complicated. It's helpful to have a place to record all your notes. And then finally, you will need a set of polyhedral dice. Uh, mostly you're going to be using 2d10s as percentile dice. These are two 10-sided dice and you use one for the 10s place and one for the 1s place to generate numbers between 1 and 100. You could also use a random number generator, app, uh, whatever works for you, whatever you like. We've got everything set up and we're ready to start our first scene. We need to put our character or characters into a situation and get this adventure started. So if you're looking for suggestions on how you might start that first scene, look at pages 63 through 66 in the book. Here are my recommendations. If you already have an idea of where this adventure might start, go with that. Trust your intuition. You could also use the random event generator in Mythic, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to generate a random idea for the first scene. I recommend putting your character into trouble, putting them in the middle of an ongoing situation so that the action gets started right away. This avoids some of the inertia problems that some new players experience where they just sort of start with nothing and they're just sort of in this town and nothing's going on. And when I say trouble, I don't necessarily mean physical danger. I just mean that there is an event, a situation that's already going on. I'm speaking generally because there's so many different ways you can do this depending on your setting and the kind of story that you're trying to tell. But think about a problem that your character might have and they're in the midst of trying to solve it based on what you already know about this character. Something you could do is look at your threads and look at your character lists and you know pick one of each randomly or by choice and put them together and see what that inspires. 
So once we know what we want our first scene to be, then we can start playing the scene and asking questions. We're in the midst of a scene, what do we do? Well, what we do depends on what kind of question we need to answer. You might have a fate question, an oracle question, or a system question. Now, this is my terminology. The book does use fate questions, but the other two are just names that I've come up with to help you think about the way in which you're gonna organize these questions. Fate questions are a really big part of Mythic, so I'm gonna hold on to those for a sec. We'll talk about that in a second. Oracle questions are questions when we need inspiration. We might encounter a new character. Who is this character? What are they like? We get into a new area. What do we find here? So depending on the tools that you already have available, you could use one of those. Or Mythic comes with a number of meaning tables which generate random words, and these will help spark, inspire ideas. Now, you're gonna have to do a little bit of work here. Mythic is gonna give you random words, and it's your job to interpret what these words mean in the context of your setting. Fortunately, you can't do it wrong because it's your game, and so whatever gets inspired, trust that idea and use that idea to move forward. So the two main meaning tables in Mythic are the action table and the descriptor table. The action table uh, is a verb and a noun combination. So use this for when you need to know uh, what happens during an event or what a character does. The descriptor table is for when you need to know what a person or creature or location is like and you need it described. And then beyond these, there are a number of specific meaning tables that you can use. And these are geared to more specific situations. The words are curated to fit into a more specific situation. Uh, I recommend familiarizing yourself with what's available and making a note of which ones you think might be useful. Don't get hung up on using the right table. Th these are just words to help you generate ideas. All you need to do is go from, I don't have an idea to, ah, I've got an idea. If you wanna use the dungeon traps table to help inspire a character, you know, go for it. Whatever you think is fun and interesting to get the kind of idea that you need. If you need an idea or you need inspiration, that's when you're gonna use an oracle. These are the oracle questions. Then we have the fate questions. This is a big part of Mythic and it interacts with some of the other systems. So when you need a yes or no answer to a question, if you were playing with a game master and you were going to ask them a question about something specific, this is when you would use a fake question. You want to know something specific uh, about the world or about the situation, or you want to test your expectation. I think it might be like this. Am I right? That's when you use a fake question. When we ask a fake question, we look at the fate chart. It's really just a fancy yes, no oracle, but it interacts with some of the other pieces of mythic. So there's great advice uh, in the book, starting on page 17 about fate questions and how to ask them. The fate chart itself is on page 19 and the printable version is on page 194. I recommend printing out the printable version and maybe even laminating it because you're gonna be using it so much and looking at it a lot. The main advice about fate questions is to phrase your question in a way that a yes answer means action or interest. The other advice is to think about before you roll, what is a yes answer going to mean in the situation? And what is a no answer going to mean? Already having little ideas about where we might be headed so that when we roll the dice and get our answer, we can go ahead and jump in that direction. And also it gives this roll meaning if we understand what's at stake instead of just, yes, things happen and no, the action stops. As it asks us, to name what our expectation is. And then either we get a yes, okay, our expectation is met, that's great, and we move forward with what we expect is going to happen, or we get a no, oh, we're surprised, this thing that we expected to be the case is not the case. Then you need to decide, in your opinion, in your understanding of the setting, what the odds are that the answer to your question is yes. Is it likely, is it very likely, all the way up to certain? Or is it unlikely, all the way down to impossible? Whichever word makes the most sense for your situation, use that row. If you're not sure, if you know, have no idea, the book recommends to just go with 50-50. Looking at our fate chart, it looks big and complicated, but it's really not, because at any given time, we're only gonna be looking at one of these boxes. We decide what we think the odds are, and then we look at our 
chaos factor. Now at the start of the game, your chaos factor is five. But for this example, say we've been playing for a little bit, our chaos factor is six and we're asking a question and we think the answer is likely. So we look at the box here and we see a big number, 75. That's the number that we have to roll under in order to get a yes answers. If we roll above 75, that means the answer is going to be no. Then there are little numbers to the left and the right. If we roll under the little number to the left, that's gonna be an exceptional yes. That's an extreme version of a yes. And same with the number to the right. If we roll above that, uh, that's an exceptional no. There are four different results that we can get from any yes or no question. And then finally, if we roll doubles, say we roll a 33 or a 66, and that single digit is lower than our chaos factor, then we are gonna trigger a random event. So for example, if our chaos factor is six and we roll a 33, that would trigger a random event. If our chaos factor is six and we roll an 88, while that's doubles, it doesn't trigger a random event. The higher the chaos factor, the more likely we're going to be encountering random events. Not only do we get yes, no, exceptional yes, and exceptional no answers, there's always a chance with every fake question that we might trigger a random event, something totally unexpected that we weren't anticipating. We will return to this idea of random events later. So that's fake questions. When we need a yes or no answer, information about a specific detail of the world or the situation, or when we have an expectation about how things are and we wanna test that expectation to see if we're correct. And then finally, there are system questions. This is when our character tries to do something and we need to know whether they succeed or fail. That's when we turn to our system, our role-playing game system that we picked out. Usually this involves rolling a die to make a skill check, but it depends on the system that you've chosen. So anytime you're interacting with the rules of the system, that's when you go to the system and say, okay, how does it resolve? All right, follow the rules, follow the procedures, roll whatever dice and get your answer. Did my character succeed or fail at this particular task? We've got Oracle questions, we've got fake questions, we've got system questions. You know, a typical flow might be at the start of the scene, asking a couple of Oracle questions to get more information about this situation. Uh, you know, asking a fake question or two to test our expectations. And then based on the information that we've gathered, our character does something. We ask a system question, okay, did we succeed or fail? And then based on that, now we're in a new situation. Do we need more inspiration? Okay, we can do that. If not, uh, then you know what does our character do now? A system question. And this is kind of the gameplay loop. If you want to see this in action, I recommend uh, on my channel, my Gozer campaign, I use Mythic. Uh, second edition, and I've got a number of different episodes, you can see how I use it and how it interacts with the system that I've chosen. So we keep asking questions until we come to the end of the scene. At a certain point, we're playing through our scene and it comes to a natural conclusion. In the book, look at pages 75 through 80 for a discussion on different ways to think about when and how to end a scene. Generally, uh, if my characters are moving to a new location, in my mind, that's a new scene. If whatever they've been trying to do since the start of the scene, if they've achieved that, generally that's the end of a scene. If that objective has become impossible, that might be an end of a scene. If the mood shifts, you know, if we were uh, playing a happy scene and it shifted to a sad scene, that might be the end of a scene. This is another one of those things you'll, you'll just get a feel for, for how you play in your particular style and how it makes sense for you to organize this emergent narrative Again, no right or wrong way to do it. But however you decide, and whenever you decide to end the scene, there's a couple of things that we need to do for our mythic system. This information is found on pages 111 to 114. So first of all, you want to record what's happening in the scene if you haven't been doing that already. Um, if you're taking notes, you know, you're gonna make some notes about, okay, here's what happened in the scene, uh, just so we can remember. So then we're going to update our thread lists. We're gonna look at our adventure and character lists and see if anything needs to change. If something showed up new in the scene, a new thread, a new mission, uh, we could add that to the thread list. Same thing with characters. If we've met a new non-player character and we wanna meet them again, if we don't care about them, if we're not interested in this character, then don't add them to the list. But if they're cool or interesting or for whatever reason we want them to show up again, 
add them to the character list. Same thing if uh, a thread has changed. If we've gotten new information, we need to change the description of a thread. We can update that now. Or if a thread has been resolved or ended for whatever reason, we can remove that off. Same thing with the character lists. Uh, if there's a character that uh, we're not going to be interacting with anymore, then we remove them from the character list. This is also just up to your interests. If you're looking at your list and it's like, oh, we haven't dealt with this thread or this character for quite a while, and I'm actually no longer interested in these things, then take them off. The threads are things that you are interested in and you want to see happen. Uh, if you're not interested in them in it anymore, take them off. And then finally, we're gonna adjust our chaos factor. The chaos factor is either gonna go up by one or down by one. The standard recommendation is that if the characters were uh, in control of the scene, the chaos goes down by one. If the characters were not in control of the scene, then the chaos goes up by one. Uh, this is up to you and your interpretation. If you're not sure, well then think about, do I want more random events to happen or less random events to happen in the next scene? And then use that to guide your decision about whether to go up or down. So we've finished our scene and we're gonna move on to the next scene. So the first thing that we need to do is test the, our expectations of the scene. Based on what's happened in the previous scene, what do we think is going to happen next? Where is our character gonna go? What is our character gonna try to do when they get there? What's the next thing that might happen based on our expectations and our understandings? So then we are gonna test this expectation by rolling uh, a single 10-sided die. And we're gonna compare it to the chaos factor. This is gonna generate one of three different kinds of scenes. The expected scene, an altered scene, or an interrupt scene. If you roll above the chaos factor, say the chaos factor is six and you roll an eight, then you proceed with the expected scene. Your expectation of what was going to happen next is true. You move forward with that. If you roll lower than or equal to the chaos factor, then what happens next depends on whether the number that you rolled is even or odd. If it's odd, you're gonna do an altered scene. So for example, if our chaos factor was six and we rolled a three, then we would play the altered scene. So what does that mean? It means the scene proceeds more or less like how we expected, but some of our expectations are sh shifted slightly. Look at pages 67 through 72 for suggestions on different ways to alter the scene. And these are, um, you know, go with your second expectation, you know, or, you know, choose an aspect of our expectation and then just tweak it slightly. You can also ask a fate question or use our oracles or meaning tables for inspiration. My favorite is the scene adjustment table on page 70. I like it because I like random tables. I roll the die and it tells me, here's the way that you're gonna alter this scene. Um, but you can use any of them or all of them. You know, you, you don't have to stick to just one. You can use different styles depending on the situation or you can pick one that you like and stick with that. Finally, uh, there's the interrupt scene. So if we roll an even number lower than our chaos factor, we would get an interrupt scene. So for example, if we, if our chaos factor was six and we rolled a four, that would be an interrupt scene. This totally replaces our expectation and generates a random event. Just like when you're rolling on the fate chart that generates random events, this works the same way. The random event is something new and surprising and this is where all the elements of Mythic come together. No matter how you've generated a random event, either from testing the expected scene or rolling on the fate chart and rolling doubles, the procedure is the same. First, you're gonna roll on the random event focus table. This is on page 37, and the printable version is on page 197. Uh, this is a handy one to have printed if you like to play analog, because you're gonna reference it fairly frequently. So this is where your adventure lists come into play. Depending on what you roll on the random focus table, it might trigger your character list or it might trigger your thread list. An NPC might take an action, they might do something, a positive event might happen to them, a negative event might happen. And then same with the threads, you might move towards a thread, which means uh, you get closer to achieving that thing, or you find a clue or make progress. Uh, you might move away from a thread, which means there's a new complication or a new obstacle to completing that thread successfully. Uh, there are other options, uh, but they're all explained in the book in detail. Remember again, that these are all just suggestions to help inspire random ideas. You don't have to follow them strictly. As long as you're inspired with a new and exciting idea, 
go with that. If you want advice on interpretation, look at the section starting on page 51. Lots of great advice on how to interpret these random elements. Regardless of how you have set up your scene, whether you got the expected scene, an altered scene, or an interrupt scene, now we've started a new scene and you can start asking questions and playing through. So you've got your oracle questions, your fate questions, your system questions, and we continue through. Then you play to the end of that scene, do the end of scene bookkeeping, and then if you're ready to keep going, you know, inspire the next scene. And you, that's the gameplay loop. So there you go. Hopefully this was helpful to those of you who needed some guidance on using Mythic 2nd Edition. Overall, and my advice for solo roleplay, not just for Mythic, is this. Follow the fun. Whatever you are doing and it's fun for you, that's playing correctly. If you're doing something and it's not fun, then that's not right. You change it until it makes sense and fun. This is just for you. You're the one who's playing the game. So fun is your barometer of success. Am I having fun? Great. I'm doing it right. If I'm not having fun, make a change, figure out what's not working to make it fun again. So there's my quick overview. I still recommend uh, reading the book because it's full of lots of great advice and play examples, not just for Mythic, but also for other kinds of solo role play. So if you enjoy this, please check out the other videos on my channel where I play a variety of solo role playing games, like subscribe and share. And if you have a question or something that you want to see a video about, let me know in the comments and I will consider that as I keep making these helpful, informative videos. Thanks so much.